I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Economics Report. The financial crisis of 2008 brought attention to a big problem with banks. Many banks did not have enough money in reserve to protect against their losses. Now, there is a proposed solution. In September, banking supervisors from 26 nations and Hong Kong met in Basel, Switzerland. They announced proposals to make banks safer by requiring them to increase their reserves. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision has been working on a set of recommendations known as Basel III. These are based on agreements reached in July by officials from a group of leading industrial nations. The goal is to stop the cycle of easing rules on banks in good times and tightening them only after a crisis. Under the new rules, banks would have to hold reserves equal to 7% of their risk-weighted assets. Mainly, this means loans. Currently, banks are required to hold 2% in reserve. The bigger reserves could be in the form of cash or common stock, also known as common equity. Banks would also have to hold extra reserves as their national economies improve. The new requirements would go into effect starting in January of 2013. Banks would have five years to fully meet them. International banking lawyer Ernie Patrikas, a former vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, explains why. He says, we cannot be telling banks on the one hand, raise capital right away, and on the other hand, lend more. One way for banks to meet the proposed new rules would be to sell more of their stock. That is what Germany's Deutsche Bank did in September. It announced a sale offer valued at over $11 billion. Ernie Patrikas thinks chief executive officers of banks have three choices. He says one is to go out and raise more common equity. Another one is to not pay dividends. And that is not something most CEOs want to do because their shareholders aren't going to be particularly happy. And the third choice is sell assets, downsize the bank. Nations on the Basel Committee will now seek to pass the new rules into law so their banking supervisors can enforce them. Banks that fall below the reserve limits could have to stop paying dividends to shareholders or bonuses to top employees. Ending dividends would anger shareholders, and limiting pay could send bankers fleeing to hedge funds, where there are fewer rules. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Toyota became the world's largest automaker in 2008. But after years of building loyalty, the Japanese company may have put its quality brand name at risk, at least temporarily. Toyota is recalling millions of cars and trucks around the world because of cases where vehicles have sped up unexpectedly. Last August, a driver in California was unable to stop. The crash killed him and three of his family members. Toyota says the problem is rare and caused by accelerator pedals becoming stuck open. On January 26th, the company suspended sales 
of eight of its top-selling vehicles in the United States, its largest market. Toyota dealers have been receiving parts to make repairs. General Motors and Ford both reported increased sales in January. But Toyota sales in the United States have fallen, and so has its stock price. Toyota says it expects costs and lost sales from its recent safety recalls to total $2 billion by the end of March. Louis Latafe spent 27 years in the car industry at Ford. Now he is Dean of the School of Management at Boston University. He says this is Toyota's biggest recall. A recall late last year involved floor mats that Toyota said could cause the accelerator to get stuck. One of the vehicles in the floor mat recall was the Prius the world's top-selling hybrid. Now, American officials are investigating the brake system on the 2010 Prius. The Transportation Department says it has received more than 120 reports, including reports of four crashes. Toyota says it found a software problem that could briefly affect the feel of the anti-lock brakes on rough or slippery roads. It says it fixed the brake problem in January. But a growing number of legal cases claim Toyota knew for a long time about the sudden acceleration issue with other vehicles. The problem reportedly has led to more than 800 crashes and 19 deaths in the past 10 years. Congress is preparing for hearings. Greg Bonner is a marketing professor at Villanova University. He says to regain trust, Toyota will have to make public everything it knows about the problems and show it accepts responsibility. The recall has also intensified questions about all the computer control systems used in modern cars. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Economics Report. A $10 billion deal aims to create the world's largest exchange company. The plan would combine the operators of the New York Stock Exchange and Germany's Frankfurt Stock Exchange. The two companies, NYSE Euronext and Deutsche Börse, announced the agreement in February. Deutsche Börse shareholders would own about 60% of the combined group. One thing it still needs is a name. The new company would have headquarters in Frankfurt and New York City. The New York Stock Exchange is the world's most famous stock market and a symbol of American capitalism. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner says New York will remain at the heart of the world's financial system for a long time to come. But the exchange business has changed in these days of high-speed trading by computers in a globally connected economy. The big board now has to compete with smaller exchanges. Where stocks are traded has become less important than how much those trades cost. NYSE Euronext and Deutsche Börse had profits of almost four and a half billion dollars last year. They expect to save 400 million dollars a year 
by combining their operations. These savings could lower the cost of stock orders. But the size of the company could raise concerns about competition in the exchange industry. The new company would also have trading operations in Britain, France, and other European countries. Stock trading and other financial services would remain important to the combined company. But much of its income is expected to come from trading complex financial products called derivatives. The deal requires approval by American and European officials and by shareholders. Other exchange operators, like the CME Group, could try to offer a higher price for NYSE Euronext. The CME Group, operator of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, is one of the world's largest traders of derivatives. Duncan Niederauer, chief executive of NYSE Euronext, is expected to keep that job in the new company. He says combining with Deutsche Börse will make the company more competitive. In February, the operators of the London and Toronto stock exchanges announced a deal to combine their companies. And in October, the Singapore exchange offered to merge with Australia's exchange. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. President Obama held a White House conference in March to discuss ways to prevent bullying in school. But bullying is a problem not just among young people. Workplace bullying can involve threats, baseless criticism, discrimination, and favoring some employees unfairly over others. 35% of Americans in a survey said they had been bullied at some time at work. The poll by Zogby International and the Workplace Bullying Institute found that another 15% have witnessed it. What some workers consider bullying by another worker or a supervisor might not always be true. But experts say productivity suffers in workplaces where employers tolerate or accept bullying. People take sick leave more often. Some take legal action. Jennifer Sandberg is a law partner in the Atlanta offices of Fisher and Phillips. She represents companies in labor cases. She says employers can avoid most problems simply by acting in a professional, business-like way. In her words, the best advice I can give to managers and supervisors is not to worry about the law, but to be sure that their behavior is professional. She says this means that everyone plays by the same set of rules. She points out that there are still basic rules that every single person in an organization needs to follow. People who bully spend less time on productive work. They can make the workplace tense and unhealthy. Author and executive coach Lauren Mackler calls it a toxic environment. She advises people to avoid emotional conflict and childlike reactions when faced with insulting criticisms. She also says people who show self-respect can be less likely targets of a bully. She gives examples like dressing well and looking people in the eye when talking to them. And Lauren Mackler advises people who feel bullied to consider how the bully got that way. She says bullies were often bullied themselves as children. In her words, that'll help you to have more compassion inside 
instead of judging the person and further feeding a toxic interaction. But bullying can cause some people to leave their job. Ms. Mackler says replacing experienced workers can cost one and a half times their yearly pay or even more. In April of 2010, Australia's Productivity Commission considered the cost of bullying in a report on workplace safety. The lowest estimate of the cost to the Australian economy 10 years ago was 6 to 13 billion dollars. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can read and listen to our programs on business and other subjects at voaspecialenglish.com. Click on the classroom link for interactive exercises. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Air traffic over much of Europe came to a halt for six days in April because of the huge cloud of ash from a volcano in Iceland. The economic costs added up as airlines flew everyone to where they were trying to go. At its worst, the crisis affected nearly a third of world air travel. About 100,000 flights were canceled or delayed. The International Air Transport Association estimated the cost to airlines at nearly two billion dollars. But that does not include costs like the tons of flowers that growers in Kenya and Israel had to destroy, or all the fruits and vegetables that could also not be flown to Europe. Other businesses that depend on air travel, including hotels and vacation places, also suffered. The crisis affected airports from Washington to Pakistan. The crisis came just as Europe is trying to recover from its worst recession in generations. Greece, a popular travel place, continues to face a debt crisis that has sharply raised its borrowing costs. The United States halted air travel for three days after the terrorist attacks in 2001. The travel ban in April lasted twice as long in some European countries. Critics accused European air transport officials of being slow to react, then overreacting to the possible risk to airplanes. The volcano eruption cost time and money for travelers. Hundreds of thousands were stuck. Some had no place to stay except the airport. Others tried to make their way by train, bus, boat, or car. Vacationers had to change or cancel plans. And not all businesses were sympathetic. An American stuck in London already one of the world's highest priced cities, found that her hotel had doubled its prices. Some embassies offered emergency loans to their citizens. Passengers delayed on European airlines may be able to get back at least some of the money they had to spend. The crisis brought new attention to the billion dollar market for travel insurance. About 30 percent of Americans buy policies to cover unexpected problems when they travel. Some credit cards offer a form of insurance and could also face claims. The volcanic eruption was the second time in two years that Iceland has shaken its neighbors to the east. The first time was the near collapse of Iceland's banks and currency during the world financial crisis. 
And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. One of the largest air shows in the United States is also one of the largest trade shows in the aircraft industry. Air Venture took place in July at an airport in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Ron Wagner is from the Experimental Aircraft Association, which holds the event each year. He said almost every major manufacturer and many smaller ones were represented. Visitors could find everything from old passenger planes to new unmanned aircraft, like the Predator drone. But Ron Wagner says the spirit of the event is best represented by the pilots and engineers who build their own aircraft. He said, much of the modern innovation has come from the home builder community in the United States. We have a lot of freedom to build, design, and fly airplanes for our own use. If you are more interested in fast cars, here is a new turn in the world of motorsports. The Speed Sisters are a racing team of eight Palestinian women in the West Bank. The team is a dream come true for Suna Aweda, the captain. But not everyone was happy to see her in the driver's seat of the BMW race car she drives. She says her family thought motor racing was not safe and mainly for men. But she says there is no sport that is especially for men or especially for women. She says women can compete with men in all kinds of sports. In June, the Speed Sisters became the first all-female racing team to compete in the Speed Test, a popular race in the West Bank. They faced some mechanical problems, but one of them finished in the top 10. The team includes Muslims and Christians, mothers, a librarian, a business student, and a woman who competed in a beauty pageant. Two of the drivers were born into racing families. The Speed Sisters received money from the British consulate in Jerusalem to buy a race car. They also received driving lessons and guidance from two British women in motorsports, Helen Elstrup and Sue Sanders. Ms. Sanders says she knew right away the Speed Sisters had the drive to succeed. She said it did not matter whether they spoke the same language or had the same culture. They had the same desire to succeed and be the best. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report. Transcripts, MP3s, and podcasts of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. Apple's new version of its desktop operating system for Mac computers is called Mac OS X Lion. Apple says this latest OS X upgrade has over 200 new features. But one big difference is how the company will sell it, only by download at its Mac App Store. The price is $29.99. Users without the current version, Snow Leopard, will have to pay an extra $30 to download the new release. Last year, Apple 
had more than $500 million in sales of its desktop operating system. Experts say download-only software is getting more common. Dave Wolf is a vice president at Synergy Systems in Washington. His company helps software designers to develop and market products. He says the computer that many people use most is their mobile phone. People who download apps to smartphones have come to expect quick and easy software updates. Now, Dave Wolf says phones are shaping expectations for other computers. Downloadable programs mean fewer trips to stores to buy software. But that can also mean fewer sales for stores that depend on physical products, including most video games. And not everyone has a high-speed internet connection to make downloads quick and easy. But Dave Wolf says the cost savings are a big help to small businesses trying to reach a wide market. I think it's a boon to small software companies and entrepreneurs who have incredible ideas and want to get them out to market. He says the internet radio service, Pandora for example, can offer free music because it has no costs of selling discs in stores. Pandora began selling shares of stock to the public in June. Next to go may be software stored on individual computers. Many companies are moving to cloud computing. The idea is to save money by storing software on somebody else's servers in large data centers. This way, people can easily access their music library or other applications from any device. This is not the case for users of Apple's iTunes. Now, Apple thinks it has a solution with a cloud computing service called iCloud. And Microsoft has developed Windows Azure. This platform is for businesses and software developers to use internet-based applications. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. For daily news and information, plus activities for English learners, go to voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Economics Report. 2009 may be remembered as the year the world avoided an economic depression. In the United States, stock prices sank to their lowest levels in March. But stocks recovered strongly for the year. The S&P 500 index gained over 20 percent, its largest increase in six years. As 2009 ended, the nation's biggest banks rushed to repay money from the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. In October of 2008, Congress approved up to $700 billion to rescue the financial industry. In December, the United States Treasury announced that Wells Fargo and Citibank had repaid $45 billion. They joined Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America in returning government aid. In June, the Treasury permitted the 10 largest banks to return their rescue money and withdraw from TARP. This let banks escape government restrictions on pay for top officials. Now, the government holds a large ownership share in only one big bank, 
Citigroup. The Treasury says it expects banks to repay $175 billion of TARP money this year. The American car industry also had big problems in 2009. Chrysler and General Motors sought bankruptcy protection from their creditors. The restructured companies may still need government aid, which has already reached over $60 billion. But a government program that paid Americans to trade in old vehicles for new fuel-saving models increased car sales in the summer. The Ford Motor Company refused government aid and is working to become profitable again by 2011. And there are signs that the industry is starting to recover. However, the housing market continues to suffer its worst downturn in generations. Mortgage financer Fannie Mae reports that payments on 5% of its single-family home loans are late. The 10% unemployment rate has meant that many people are struggling with their house payments. Still, consumer confidence grew in December. Experts say Americans were feeling better about the job market and the economy. Growth in the United States is expected to reach about 2.5% in 2010. And that's the VOA Special English Economics Report.